two. Backup test, one, two.
Uh, Katrina is, but I'm going to do a little work the crowd. I thought I'd work. I, I thought you would stand up or something. And did, you, did somebody talk to Das about a moment of silence? Yeah, he's going to do it. Uh, so, folks, we're going to get started here. I know people will be drifting in. And I know that the current circumstances have made it difficult for a lot of people to get here. One thing I would suggest, since at the moment we're a small crowd, is if the folks at this end could move over here, because we'll be doing some PowerPoint, you'll be able to see the screen a lot better. And um, I know there's always a desire to sit near the door for obvious reasons, but if you could just uh, consolidate a little bit, that would be great. Uh, so I'm Richard Applebaum, a fielding graduate university faculty member for close to four decades. And um, I'll sort of lay out how this will work in a little bit. But first, I want to introduce our president, Katrina Rogers, who will give the official fielding welcome. Good afternoon, everyone. So this is the official fielding graduate university. Welcome. Welcome. For those of you who don't know Fielding, Fielding was founded in Santa Barbara in 1974 by a group of enterprising faculty from UCSB and other places, and they had imagined a new kind of graduate education model. And they said we could break out of convention conventional forms of graduate learning and invent a whole new way of thinking about learning for adult learners, mid-career professionals, social sciences. And that's what Fielding does. And we've been here ever since. And we now have students and faculty from 38 states, but we're very grounded here in Santa Barbara. So I just want to welcome members of the public as well as our own Fielding community members. We have a great session plan today. And I won't introduce the speakers, but we have an illustrious panel. We also have a few dignitaries with us, including a brand newly minted sworn in city council member, Kristen Snedden. Kristen, can you stand up just so we can <laughs> congratulate you and thank you. I'm sure you're, thank you. There you are. Thank you. Really appreciate your service. Congratulations. And if there's anyone else who's also been maybe sworn in? No, OK. And of course, this is a subject that happens to be near and dear to my heart. I am an environmental policy political scientist, and I have taught on the environment and a number of issues ranging from water to global problems to politics to policy uh, since the early 1990s. So it is. It's, and it's also a somber week to have this particular panel. And we even thought about, well, should we cancel it? Because we know some people will not be able to get here. And first of all, I want to commend our panelists as a team who all said, no, we're going to be here. And especially given some of the complexities that they're laboring under this week, uh, that's, that's really admirable. Because it also shows a commitment to this issue of water. And one of the most um, compelling ways to think about water is it is the defining issue of the 21st century. And we've only just started to realizing just how vulnerable 
the entire planet is in this regard. And so it is excellent that we have so many dedicated people from so di different spheres of influence and sectors really applying their time and talents to this problem. So now that I have had the opportunity to welcome you all, I'm going to now turn this over to two people who've really done so much work within fielding as well as externally to bring and build greater awareness, understanding, and action around sustainability. And these are two members and leaders of our sustainability working group, uh, fondly known as SWIG, and that would be uh, Dr. David Willis, faculty member. Please stand up and come on up to the mic. And Julie Schmesnick O'Brien, uh, alumna of Fielding. Thank you, everyone. Th thank you so much, Katrina. I am an anthropologist, very interested in water issues around the world. I do work. I do work in southern India. In two weeks, I'm going to be helping with a project called Friendly Water for the World. We're creating. We're doing training for creating bio sand water filters. Uh, to clean water so people won't be sick and so on. But water is the one of the defining issues, if not the defining issue of uh, this century for sure. Uh, in 2012, a group of us, Julie and myself and Carol Castle from Florida and a number of other people, decided we needed to address issues of sustainability school wi schools wide at Fielding Graduate University. We have a number of schools and we thought, this is an issue that goes across borders, goes across silos or whatever within the university. So we've had a handout here that tells our activities uh, to you uh, since 2012. And Julie will mention a few. Uh, Julie will mention a few of these, but I just wanted to note that last summer uh, we had our national session. We have two national sessions a year. The second week of January here in Santa Barbara, all our students are coming together with all the faculty. And then in the summer, last summer we were in Tucson, Arizona, and we had a panel titled "Southwest Native American Tribes Panel on Climate Change Adaptation." And the previous day, we'd visited Biosphere 2 and checked that out. And Biosphere 1, of course, is our Earth. So Julie, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Well, what I would like to say is I'm Julie Smenswick O'Brien. And I am from the great state of Minnesota. And uh, perhaps you've heard uh, the land of 10,000 lakes. I worked for a number of years at the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources. And in fact, we have closer to 15,000. However, in the year 2012, we had disaster declarations in two-thirds of our 87 counties. In half of them, the disaster was a drought. In the other half, the disaster was flooding. So we have different kinds of water issues throughout the world and in different places. And uh, what I would like to say about this sustainability work group is that we have been a mix of faculty and students and alumni and committed individuals. Uh, we now have one from the community that has joined the Sustainability Working Group. And uh, what you see on the list has come from the fertile minds and uh, creative thinking about what can we do to foster awareness from a policy standpoint, from a practical standpoint, from a curriculum standpoint. How can we help our learning community to learn more about these issues because they are important issues. And so uh, along with David, I thank you for being here, and uh, we have uh, badges, a few of us, uh, the Sustainability Working Group, and happy to visit with you afterwards, should you care to do that. So thanks for coming. Thanks, Julie, and I'll turn it over to Rich now. Thank you, David and Julie. So I thought long and hard about how best to introduce this topic um, under the circumstances that we face today. And it is with a heavy heart myself, and I think all of us, that we're gathered together to discuss this issue of water in Santa Barbara and California. When the Sustainability Working Group, of which I'm a member, came up with this topic several, uh, several months ago, we were thinking about the seven-year drought, Lake Kachuma, its effect on state and local water supplies, and maybe the broader ecological implications, such as climate change. Today we've seen the reality of a seven-year drought in our area. The title, Water, Water Everywhere, Will There Be a Drop to Drink, has incredible salience today in Montecito, where there is water everywhere and that water can't be drunk. It's contaminated. Uh, barely a month ago, the Thomas Fire, 
which is the largest in terms of acreage in California history, claimed nearly a thousand structures in Ventura before it headed west and came to Santa Barbara with the speed of a freight train, really. Thomas Fire would have devastated our community if it hadn't been for the heroism of close to 9,000 firefighters from all over the West who made a stand and kept it from coming into Santa Barbara. Um, my wife and I were under mandatory evacuation. We were out of our home for almost two weeks. Uh, we had lost our home in a wildfire, the Tea Fire, nine years ago in Santa Barbara. Um, so I had a pretty good sense of uh, what people were feeling like. Uh, that fire deforested the hills above Montecito, which hadn't burned in many years. And uh, the combination of a deforested hillside and very hard soil, the result of years of drought, uh, created the tragedy that occurred just three days ago on Tuesday. The early morning hours on Tuesday, when people were asleep, rivers of mud, boulders, trees, debris, swept down the lovely canyons that many of us know intimately from hiking, swept down watercourses, which are almost always dry, and uh, swept its way all the way to the ocean. In the process, hundreds of homes were lost, some hundred homes, I understand completely. Uh, 17 people lost their lives, and um, a sea of misery um, unfolded there. Um, I was talking to Das about this uh, a moment ago. They published the names of the list of people who had perished in the fire uh, yesterday, and it's hard to look at that list. Um, it's hard to look at that list. Um, two children, what, something like four and eight years old or 10 years old from one family. Ages range from three years old to, I guess, in the late 80s. Um, um, lives were destroyed. Uh, Casa de Maria, for those of you who know Santa Barbara, which is an absolutely beautiful spiritual retreat center uh, in the mountains uh, in Montecito, where fielding originated long before um, we started coming to hotels like this. Um, we went to Casa de Maria for our retreats. It was a place where you could replenish yourself uh, spiritually as well as learn um, much of it has been destroyed. It's under a sea of mud. To add to this tragedy, um, as I understand it, the um, pipes, the connections uh, that uh, bring water into Montecito to a reservoir ruptured, and that holding capacity broke itself, dumping itself millions of gallons of water. Um, so Montecito is currently much of it without potable water. So these events are a reminder of the power of nature, if we ever needed to be reminded. One of the topics I hope we'll be addressing today is what we can do uh, before we humans uh, destroy the lovely planet in which we find ourselves. Um, before I introduce our panelists, what I thought we would do is have a moment of silence to um, honor um, what is happening, and I've asked Das Williams, whose district in the county includes Montecito, to lead us in that. Folks, I'd, I'd just love a moment of silence, and however you um, may do that, um, but to honor the slain uh, and to remember um, and support and hope for uh, the living. Um, out there and, and, and to think towards the rebuilding um, both of Montecito and of our community after this um, now five week natural disaster. Thank you. Thank you, Des. So now what I'd like to do is introduce our panelists. I'll introduce them all at the beginning um, so you have a sense of uh, the incredible uh, panel that we pulled together for this. And then I'm going to turn it over to Das Williams, who will both moderate and participate. I've asked the panelists to make maybe a seven-minute or so presentation in the beginning, 
and then we'll spend maybe the rest of the first hour or a little more uh, with questions which were developed by the Sustainability Working Group, then we'll open it up to the audience. Uh, so first, uh, well, Das Williams. Um, das is the supervisor of the first district in Santa Barbara County, which as I said is a district that includes Montecito. Um, he's newly arrived in that position and he's had a lot to deal with. Uh, during the Thomas fire and during this disaster, his, um, his messages uh, which he would send uh, post on his website and send out to people on his Facebook page. Uh, for us personally, were very important, and I thank you for that, and knowing what was happening, where to go, um, who to turn to, where to evacuate, and so on. And I want to give you special thanks, because I know you're dealing with this right now, so much appreciated. Uh, before he um, joined the county supervisors, uh, Das served in the state assembly from 2010 to 2016, where he represented half of Santa Barbara County and a quarter of Ventura County, and before to that, he served seven years on the Santa Barbara City Council. So he's really Mr. Santa Barbara. He's been at all levels of governance here and even some before that. Um, um, Hannah Beth Jackson, in addition to being Santa Barbara's leading auctioneer, um, uh, was elected to the California Senate in 2012, and she represents all of Santa Barbara County and Western Ventura County. Uh, Hannah Beth chairs the uh, Senate Judiciary Committee and serves as a member of the Senate Committee on Natural Resources and Water. And I know from knowing her for many years that she is a tireless, tireless advocate for social justice and a very powerful and outspoken voice in the state of California. Um, she's the author of the California Fair Pay Act and was named by the Huffington Post as one of 11 women around the country blazing new trails in American politics. And I should note also that in the wake of the um, Thomas Fire, um, she introduced several bills that will strengthen the state's emergency alert system, including a measure which would translate um, alerts into um, you know, different languages uh, spoken in California, immigrant communities. And while it's not directly relevant to water, in response to the Trump administration's decision to resume drilling, uh, she's reintroduced legislation uh, to ban, uh, once again, to maintain the ban of offshore drilling um, in California. Uh, Kenneth Kahn is the tribal chairman of the Santinez Band of Chumash Indians. When he was only 25 years old, he became the youngest person ever to serve on the Chumash business community. He was elected that position for seven consecutive terms, serving as secretary, treasurer, and vice chairman through various milestones, which included the purchase of nearly 1,400 acres of Santa Inez ranch land in the valley known as Camp 4, the acquisition of two hotel properties, and the launch of Kit Wines. Hmm. If I'd known, we would have had some here. <laughs> um, Kenneth was elected tribal chairman in April 2016. Under his leadership, the tribe has completed its casino expansion project and Camp 4 was placed under federal trust by the Bureau of Indian Affairs. And he worked with DAS to provide rooms available in Solvang during the Thomas Fire for evacuees. And finally, Carolee Krieger um, is the founder and head of the California Water Impact Network, or CWIN, which is an NGO that works for uh, equitable allocation of California water, protects open water ecosystems and salmon fisheries, and seeks to stop poor irrigation practices from poisoning land, wetlands, rivers, and um, wildlife, and we'll actually see a short video on that when uh, Carolee takes the podium. She is a Hawaii native who moved to Santa Barbara in 1970. You beat me by a year. Um, and uh, her interest in the water began as a member of Santa Barbara Citizen Planning Association, which is an organization which really helped to shape Santa Barbara politics uh, for many years and then went on to organize CWIN to search for equitable water allocation, educate the public, and also engage in litigation, which I'm sure you'll talk about, but uh, she's done litigation at the state level. So with that, I'd like to turn this over to Das Williams, and I'll let you run the rest of the show, Das. Great. We'll uh, start with uh, the, our opening statement, I suppose, if we treat this in that, in that format. And I'll just go uh, down, down the line and, and start with 
Carol Lee. Carol Lee? Um, would you please put up a brief um, three minute video that we have by. Hello, I'm Yvonne Chouinard. I'm the founder. Yvonne Chouinard, in addition to being the founder and CEO of Patagonia, also received Fielding Social Justice Award several years ago. And he's a founder of CWIN as well. Of the clothing company Patagonia and co-founder of CWIN, which is the California Water Impact Network. We've been concerned about California's water policy for a long time. Before we run out of petroleum or, or topsoil or anything, we're going to run out of water. This tunnel project, they say, is going to cost $90 billion, but you know what? It usually comes out double that. In any case, it's going to double your water bills for every single person in California. And this is just for the sake of a few giant industrial agriculture interests. Agriculture in California uses up 80% of our water and only provides 2% to the economy. Water doesn't belong to big business. Water belongs to all of us. I want to tell you about paper water. Paper water is fake water, water that the government and corporations tell us exists but really doesn't exist. In reality, we only have one-fifth of that water left in California. The water in the Delta belongs to all of the people of California, and it belongs to the salmon and, and to the fisheries, and, and it's being stolen by big agribusiness and big corporations. The public trust doctrine is a very effective method to use in the courts. It's been used in the Mona Lake case, where we stopped Los Angeles from stealing the water from Mona Lake, and I believe it can be used to stop this crazy scheme of the Twin Tunnels. The public trust doctrine is embedded in our Constitution, and it states that our natural resources, including water, belongs to the people and serve the needs of the people. We need to tell our California legislators to stop printing paper water and demand a comprehensive plan to rein in the waste and achieve a sustainable future for the water in California. Right now, CWIN needs to raise a million and a half dollars to complete an environmental and economic assessment of the Delta watershed. This assessment is urgent and is the foundation of the public trust doctrine. This assessment will be done by ECHO Northwest, which is the same organization whose independent assessment saved Mono Lake. Just remember, it's your water, it's our money, and it's our future. This is our water, and you can't steal it. CWIN was formed in 2001 as a result of a, an opportunity to stop the privatization of the state water project that had begun with the Monterey Amendments to the state water project contracts. And now what we found out through three years of intense research is what Yvonne was talking about. The issue of paper water is central to what's wrong in California with our water. There's five and a half times more water promised than exists. <coughs> and the environment is getting shafted in this deal. And so what we are, have set into motion is through the State Water Resources Control Board, we have standing at, the, at all of the hearing processes that are going on, including the change of point of, of diversion petition that's currently going on there now, which is a needed permit that the, uh, needed by the state in order to construct the twin tunnels. Now, this will give us an opportunity, if we can raise the money and get the public trust analysis done, to introduce the value of what the environment is, the real value. We want to force an adjudication of the Delta watershed, save 20 rivers, the three runs of salmon, and so many more species, and save the ratepayers in California, we believe as much as $100 billion for water that doesn't exist. This is gonna hurt, the, if, the, if, the, if the tunnel project goes through, it will really hurt the ratepayers, especially in California, I mean in Santa Barbara, because we already have such a large bill with the state water project. This will make it just go through the roof. And for any of you who are interested, we have done, and I was hoping to bring today, but um, I, 
we're under a mandatory evacuation and all of my paperwork is still at my house, which thank God I have a house, it still exists. <coughs> Um, but if you are interested, I'll give you a card and make sure that you get a copy of the Santa Barbara report, which details the, the for South Coast Water Agency's water use, the demand, costs, and what we believe they can do to stop the, the demand from spiraling and the costs from spiraling. We believe there is a fix a real fix to California's water problems, but the first thing that the state needs to do is actually measure how much is there. You can't manage what you don't measure. You can't manage what you don't understand. And it's imperative that we apply the California Constitution, Article 10, Section 2, against waste and unreasonable use, and that we have a public trust analysis to give the environment a seat at the table. We're going to fight hard for this, and um, I'm pretty sure we're going to get it done. Um, we're we're very a very determined bunch, and you know we've had a lot of of the water buffaloes we call them the the big corporate interests um, standing against us. But we have the truth and the law on our side, so I believe we will prevail. And I'd be happy to answer any questions later. Thank you, Carolee. <laughs> Chairman Kahn. Excellent. So I have a PowerPoint. Do I have a control somewhere? I'll put them. Oh, you, got, you got this for me. Uh, by the way, this is a photo of a Lake Kachuma full and um, empty. So while he's pulling that up, so uh, my name is Kenneth Kahn. I'm the chairman of the San Inez Band of Chumash. Uh, I got to talk to a few folks uh, walking in here, and uh, I know we have uh, some folks from other tribes, uh, also from other states. And so, um, you know, in California, we're very unique. We have 109 federally recognized tribes. That's California alone. There's 562 in the nation. Um, you know, many of you from New Mexico or Arizona or some other states that uh, have tribes that have thousands and thousands and thousands of acres. Uh, that's not the case uh, with the San Inez Band of Chumash or many tribes in California. Um, we are one of the smallest tribes, the only tribe in Santa Barbara County, um, and you know we have a small reservation of about 140 acres. Um, water is and has always been a challenge for us. Uh, water is is sacred, and uh, you know we we really. Uh, honor it uh, by making an offering, uh, by cherishing it, and by being responsible with it. So for us, um, water consciousness is a way of life, whether it's a drought uh, or whether we have plentiful amounts of it. So if uh, you please move to the next slide. I think I kind of got ahead of myself a little bit. Um, but as protectors of our, our natural resource, you know, we take this very serious, uh, not only by conserving uh, what we use, but also by recycling what we use, uh, and then finding uh, ways to be able to supplement our, our potable water with recycled water. Uh, moving on to slide three. Um, our water sources on the reservation. Uh, now, we're a, a, a micro example of what we can do in communities, um, and we're very fortunate to be in the situation we are in. But uh, on the reservation, we have uh, two different water supplies. Um, one is through our local water district, uh, known as ID1, Interdistrict 1, um, and then the other is uh, through water wells on site. We have five wells, uh, but we, we aren't on the mother load of water. So, you know, again, uh, being responsible uh, uh, with what we have, with the resource we have, um, we've uh, developed a wastewater treatment services, both with partnerships with uh, our local city, our local um, uh, community service district, uh, and then also with the, the development of our own wastewater treatment plant. Um, we, we currently have a facility that produces uh, about 400,000 gallons per day uh, in recycled water. Uh, moving on. Um, we've also uh, looked at water conservation and water consciousness from other, other avenues. Uh, through our Chumash Environmental Office. Um, you know, other ways of, of preparing our lands 
uh, you know, to be uh, environmentally conscious is, you know, we've been able to look at uh, eradicating uh, some of our, um, um, so some of the plants that may not be native to the area. Uh, one example, and I know, I know Santa Barbara County and also in California, it's a problem, is Arundo. Um, and uh, the amount of water that it uses is just, uh, I mean, it's, it's out of this world. And of course, ironically, uh, Rondo was introduced by the Spanish uh, missionaries. And so for us, uh, we, that was our first uh, task was to uh, eradicate that from, from our waterways and our, our areas. Um, also with education, um, you know, being able to educate our community on how uh, we can be more responsible um, uh, with uh, uh, our landscaping, with the creation of bioswells, um, and really just focusing on uh, uh, teaching each other how we can, we can uh, uh, be consci conscientious to Mother Earth and to our, one of our most precious resources, water. Um, protecting our, our resources and our riparian habitats also include uh, water monitoring, monitoring um, you know, monthly and annually. Um, we have a number of, of water wells that we, we test from, um, looking at uh, uh, the flow, measuring the flow, also looking at some of the uh, 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 microinvertebrates that uh, inhabit the waterways uh, and being conscious to how uh, they're impacted as well. Um, um, so uh, really we're, we're looking at a global approach to how we can manage water within our tiny borders uh, as a tiny tribe. Um, our tribal non-point source management, um, I know today you know, we're, we're talking about contamination. Uh, from from runoff in a in a massive way, but on a daily basis, you know, uh, not everybody uh, has the ability to um, really think about how what our impacts are with water runoff. Um, that's another program that we focus on um, through our uh, uh, tribal environmental um, uh, office, uh, looking at uh, some of our trash and debris uh, removal, our storm drain, making sure they're marked. Uh, also pet, uh, as, as little things like pet way stations as well, uh, street sweeping, uh, and just again, ongoing community uh, education. Uh, our, our recycled water um, is probably our, our, uh, uh, the, the biggest impact to preser preservation. Um, you know, through that we've uh, developed our facility, uh, 400 gallon per day processing that has both federal and state uh, compliance uh, certificates. Uh, recently, uh, in the last couple of years, we've become Title 22 compliant, so we can use it off reservation. Um, we have uh, uh, you know, uh, 350,000 gallon storage capacities. Um, we have booster stations to be able to pump it to uh, some of the higher grounds uh, on our reservation. Um, and so that's something that we've actually been able to recently complete. Uh, we. For those that know of uh, our situation, we have an upper and a lower uh, uh, reservation and we're able to, to pump uh, through our new systems uh, from the lower to the upper. Um, our our re recycled water uses on reservation, we use it for landscaping, cooling towers, toilet flushing, um, off reservation also for landscape irrigation, Caltrans landscaping, emergency use and wildfire suppression. One of our programs uh, 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 for our, our community recreational spaces is also uh, we've, we've been able to adapt to uh, pumping reclaimed water to be able to water uh, all of our outdoor areas. Um, and this is our newest four acre park that uh, we just had a ribbon cutting this past Saturday. Um, we have a future project that we're really proud of and that's the Tribal Museum. Uh, that took a lot of uh, planning um, to be able to put the infrastructure in to use reclaimed water for that project as well. We're projecting that we're going to have about a 70% reduction in water use based on what the needs of the pro uh, project are, and that's primarily due to our re recycled water program. Um, for those that are familiar with our tribe, uh, we are one of California's many gaming tribes. So. Um, looking at uh, water conservation and recycling, you know, our largest property uh, is the Chumash Casino Resort. And I just wanted to share a couple of statistics uh, with you. Um, when we first built our expanded facility, uh, we were projected uh, to use about 90,000 gallons per day. Because of our water recycling program, our actual, a year later after those projections, 
were 27,000 gallons per day. That's one third of the water that uh, we would have normally used without recycled water. Uh, we recently just finished an expansion in 2016. We projected that our numbers would go up to about 36,000 gallons per day of usage. Now, I'm speaking uh, specifically of potable water that we get from our water district right now. Um, the uh, the uh, projections were 36,000 gallons per day. Our actuals a year later were 28,000 gallons per day. So uh, we're still at one third of our 2004 uh, projected water usage, and that's uh, been a, an amazing uh, a feat for the tribe. Um, when I talk recycled water, um, we use about 72,700 uh, gallons per day of recycled water. 78% um, of that water goes towards toilet flushing. 16% of that is used in our cooling towers, and 6% of that is used for our irrigation. So that just gives you an idea how when you're looking at commercial, uh, how, and of course it's a, a tertiary treated plant, so it has to be tertiary treated in order to use it for those uses, so. He's moving me right along. Um, so this is just a few of the awards that we're very proud of, but uh, again, it's an honor to be here to share uh, a micro model of how we can be more responsible, more conscious. Um, I heard earlier this is our water. I'd like to uh, add that we, we need to honor it uh, by being responsible how we use it. So thank you very much. Thank you, Chairman Kahn. Senator Jackson. Thank you. Uh, my apologies for stepping out. Um, we're sort of in an active situation here, and it's just being announced that the Highway 101 is not going to open on Monday uh, because the situation uh, at that uh, at the Olive Mill uh, Hot Springs River, no, it's not a river, lake, is getting worse, not better, uh, for a variety of reasons. And this is Secretary Brian Kelly, who's just returning my call. Could you give me one second to try to Absolutely. talk with him, and I'll explain in a minute. And I, and I, I will uh, step in there for and um, give my seven minutes. Uh, you know, I think it's important to reflect that um, water is everything. For us, biologically, um, it's, it's everything. Um, for, and if you think about um, the story of civilization, the story of, of human beings go anywhere beyond um, really a hunter-gatherer stage of development, is really a story of the world's great riverine systems and the great watersheds. Um, you know, what, what is Rome without the Tiber? What is Egypt without the Nile? What is Mesopotamia without the Tigris and Euphrates? People used to know where their water came from. And um, when I taught undergrads, I always asked a series of questions in uh, their first class. And judging from that, um, you know, UCSB students are pretty smart uh, compared to the general public. But judging from that, we, that is a knowledge we have lost. And I'd wager um, that is, is part of the problem. It wasn't so long ago that um, environmentalists said that our century would be a century where the crisis of water has hit um, a new low or has hit a boiling point. And they said that we would see wars over water. And uh, that was always derided by many people as um, doomsday fantasies. Um, but I think we can conclusively say that the first water um, war of the 21st century has already begun uh, in Syria. Mo many of the problems that we call other problems are um, also water problems. Energy problems are water problems. And in this case, um, while it complicates things to have brutal dictatorship. Um, uh, it may have been the spark that Syria has 
undergone the worst drought that it has um, in centuries, um, right um, as uh, other factors help destabilize it. So I think it's important for us to look at it from the large picture and say, um, if it's that important, is it that important also to us? If it's that important globally, is it that important to us? And I think the fundamental question about water to me is, what are we willing to do to do things differently? If we are doing things that are not working, what are we willing to do? And unfortunately, we have to kind of fight against human nature on how to look at this. Because I can tell you, um, having, having served this community as an ele elected official uh, in those three capacities um, now for 14 years, I can tell you what happens every time there is a crisis. People instinctively go towards the biggest, most expensive, longest to build, most difficult to permit solution for any problem. The things that are most rapid to implement, the things that are cheapest to implement, the things that individuals can do, they are very averse to doing because because that means I need to blame some, I can't blame someone else. I've got to do something myself. And, and that isn't easy to do. Um, but to me, uh, I am passionate about this issue because I think fundamentally it's one of the two issues, and of course it's intertwined with the other one, which is energy, that challenge our own image of ourselves in this county. Are we the birthplace of environmentalism? Are we the ones who are going to help lead the world in where we go? Or are we a bunch of talkers? And I, you know, I, you know, I'll I'll give you a, a, a primary example, and I don't cast blame on anyone in particular because this is a problem that is all of our um, instinct. So, you know, I, I served for seven years on the city council in Santa Barbara. Um, every, every single one of us that served during that time was very proud of the fact that in that time we um, led the, the city towards going towards 32% renewable energy. Um, all of that is gone now. In fact, you know, the irony is a couple weeks before the city council mm -hmm. voted to embrace a 100% renewable energy goal, the council made, you know, the city, I don't want to say it's just the council, it's, it's a decision we made together. The city actually went radically the other direction into dirty energy. The city um, doubled its share of dirty energy uh, the moment the switch on that desal plant was turned on. And, you know, uh, desal is a great solution as long as you don't care about how much energy you're using or um, how much money you're spending and you have enough money to pay those increased water rates. There's a lot of people in this community that that's an issue for. Um, and, and while I don't think, I think it should be a tool in the toolbox and it's something obviously that um, has been done here, um, all, of the, the, all of the work that we in the state legislature have done, uh, Hannah Beth and myself and, and, and countless others, as you might know, I, I was the principal co-author, which means the second, secondary author for the um, Senate Bill 350, which is our big climate change legislation. All that work could be outdone if every coastal community does what we did. 
all of it. And so to me, it's a question about who we are, who we are going to be. Um, do we toss our principles out when, when we feel like we need to? Um, or can we find another way? And I, I hope that's something that we talk more about today. Um, <coughs> thank you for staying active during this crisis. I, you know, every day we, every day for this whole, um, since December 4th, we have had a legislative briefing where the county emergency personnel has all the our lead, elected leaders to give them a briefing. And I gotta tell you, Senator Jackson has been so engaged for that whole time. Um, so uh, why don't you finish your opening statement, Beth? That's why I got gray hair. <laughs> um, thank you, and uh, uh, just to update you, uh, I feel obligated. I, I hate it when people are on their cell phones when I'm talking, and thank you for <laughs> indulging me. Um, so the uh, freeway, uh, they won't be able to open the freeway, but we're trying to get trains up here uh, from Ventura and down so that people can move on to their, to their work. Coming up here, we have 16,000 people a day who commute up here, and we're trying to get additional trains and potentially even uh, more frequency so that we can, in fact, get people back to work, and that's what that call just was. Um, I want to thank um, the chairman. He reminded me that uh, I think uh, one of the most wonderful um, attitudes and philosophies we have learned from our Native American uh, brothers and sisters is a, a quote, and I think I've got this fairly right. Uh, if we were to apply this in how we view life, uh, it would make all the difference in the world, and that is that we, we don't inherit the earth from our ancestors, we borrow it from our children. And uh, that has been the, the sort of the philosophy I've tried to uh, adopt in my work um, in the legislature. But uh, one of the things about politics that I have learned in the 12 years that I've been banging my head against the wall in Sacramento is that our uh, politics is the art of the possible. And um, while we, we want things to be our way, and particularly in the world today, there is an enormous amount of resistance, and that is uh, promoted by an enormous amount of money. And money really does drive a great deal of the policy, and uh, the notion that uh, water is a commodity and can be bought and sold rather than a necessity of life is part of what has created the problem and the challenge that we deal with today. So I just throw that out. Um, what I'd like to do, sort of to get this started a little bit, is to just kind of give you a reality check on our situation here with water in this county right now. And uh, so I've got a PowerPoint. And as a recovering lawyer, I don't usually use PowerPoints. I figure if I can't explain it with words, then I might as well go home. But um, what I will do, is um, do my best and, and have you move this along um, as, I, as I try to sort of present this. So the district I represent is all of this county, all of Santa Barbara County from stem to stern uh, and all of western Ventura County up to the top of the Conejo grade and areas uh, surrounding that. Um, the entire district is still being classified as a moderate drought area which is extraordinary. Um, and after the Thomas fire, when we were seeing fire moving at a rate of one acre a second, you gotta say that is not a moderate drought. That's seven years of dryness that has, uh, that created the largest wildfire in California history and at the latest time in the year. And I think we need to recognize that fire season now doesn't go from April to October. It goes from January to December. And that is one of the realities we have to deal with. We are in a period of drought. We have insufficient water. Um, we have tried all sorts of things, and we must do more. But as a result of this, uh, we have been trying to bring all the different water agencies together, all the different environmental groups, our uh, agricultural community, which does use 80% of the water in California. 
uh, urban areas use 20%. We have got to do better, and agriculture is important. People need to eat. Uh, but we have got to do a better job trying to reduce water usage. You know, with technology today, we have to have new ideas using new technology uh, in order to reduce that water consumption. So um, let me just kind of show you the reality of where we are at the moment, which I will tell you has been made even worse by the fires um, that have, re that have uh, further uh, degraded our watershed. So the first uh, slide is an image uh, of the Kachuma Reservoir located off of uh, Highway 150. When Kachuma is full, um, it supplies 80% of the South Coast's drinking water. It's not off 150. That's Lake Casitas, right? Kachuma? Yeah, that's the wrong number. <laughs> See, I didn't have a chance to... 154. 154. Oh, a typo. Okay, my bad. Um, so, um, Kachuma supplies 80% of the South Coast drinking water. That's 225,000 people are served by Lake Kachuma. Uh, it serves five districts, the city of Santa Barbara, Montecito, Goleta, Carpinteria Valley, and the San Inez Water Conservation District. That is a lot of people with one water source. In 2016, as you'll see in this photo, Kachuma reached a low point of 7% capacity. That's a puddle. And notice the vast portions of the lake bed uh, were exposed. So let's go to the second slide. This is a more recent photo of Kachuma. In July of last year, the Whittier fire tore through this area, destroying much of the hillsides. As this, is a, this is a recurring theme and a recurring nightmare. So, so the, uh, destroyed much of the hillsides surrounding uh, Kachuma and significantly impacted the watershed. And you can see from this photo, uh, the burn area goes right around the shoreline. Well, what happens when we have rain? Where do you think all of that burnt area and sediment and soot and ash is going to go? So here's the third uh, slide. Uh, here are a couple more pictures that show the area around Kachuma after the Whittier fire. On the right, you can see the burn area comes right to the shore next to the intake tower that pumps the water to southern Santa Barbara County. And in the fourth slide, similarly, are photos of the area surrounding Jameson Rev Reservoir, which is the primary supply of surface water for the Montecito Water District. It was destroyed almost entirely in the Thomas Fire. Now, I flew over this today in a helicopter with some of our National Guard folks. And while the flooding and the damage there is just absolutely incomprehensible, the enormity of the burned area from the fire is equally as mind-boggling all of our watershed going on to the mountains into the back country. 440 square miles burned in this Thomas fire, and the Jameson watershed and reservoir was virtually destroyed. That has been the singular or the primary source and almost the entire source of drinking water for Montecito. The fifth slide, uh, these last two photos also show the extent of the fire's damage to the area. So, so why does this matter? Well, we find ourselves in Santa Barbara County in a u unique predicament. We're in a period of historic drought, but given the extensive damage to our watershed from the Thomas and Whittier fires, and then from previous fires just a couple of years ago, uh, Zaka, and just think of all the fires. If you've lived here for a decade, you've been through, I think, seven or eight major fires. Our virtual watersheds have been completely compromised in the process of all of these drought-driven events. So um, the, it is very likely that our primary surface water reservoirs will be heavily impacted by rain events, just like the one we experienced this past week. So that's just the water. That doesn't, that doesn't tell you about the homes that were lost, the streets that don't even exist anymore, houses that have disappeared because they're all down by uh, the Olive Mill um, area by the Montecito Inn, and the 17, almost, actually I think today they were going to announce the, they found another body, so 17 or 18 uh, bodies that have been found, and there are still some people missing. 
Um, so we have um, to, cut, to re realize as we try to deal with the art of the possible that the ground cover in the hills surrounding both Kachuma and Jameson is gone. Yet the rain we so de desperately need to refill uh, our reservoirs are going to be compromised because they're going to be filled with debris and toxic materials and God only knows what else um, as a result of these rains. So it's going to make it difficult and expensive at best uh, and impossible at worst to treat our water supply. I mean, that's just the reality. So given these challenges, it's more important than ever. Uh, as a region, we begin to invest in projects that can make our water supply more diverse. And um, we have convened uh, with the help of the uh, head of the Office of Emergency uh, Services Management, actually is what they call it in the state, and I happen to chair the Joint Legislative Committee on Emergency Services, so I work very closely with this incredible uh, man named Mark Ghilarducci. I would issue him sainthood, but he insists that he is not. Um, but the work that he has done, uh, basically to pull everybody together in this community, and you know, they say that whiskey is for drinking and water is for fighting over. That's an old California expression. And they are not kidding. But today, because of the urgency of what's going on in our community, um, it is my hope and expectation that with Montecito literally out of water, um, the delivery system has been compromised. Um, part of the problem with the 101 down by uh, uh, Olive Mill and Hot Springs is that water continues to run. We're not sure it could be water from the hillsides. We, it could be water that uh, a number of the uh, hydrants because of these boulders, it was sheared off, and that water is running. Uh, the, the damage to the pipes themselves from the flowing uh, debris and so forth, we're not quite sure what it is, but we are losing water. We are losing quality water, and we are in a real pickle right now. So I'm, uh, I, gosh, that is depressing, isn't it? But anyway, but one of the things that we have is that, you know, we are innovators. We have, we understand that there are many different ways to address this problem. We've seen what conservation can do. It's a big element. There are a number of different options to consider. Some of them are not things that are ideal, um, but at the end of the day, we need water. So let's find the best ways to approach this. Let's, let's resist any effort to make water a commodity and profit driven. That is our biggest challenge right now and uh, go from there. Well, that, that, that'll be a good uh, tee off of my um, basic uh, question to all of our panelists, which is to define the problem. I think it, it helps us try to think about what is the solution, but to start with defining what the problem is, is it as simple as some people ask? or some people maintain, uh, I think uh, there would be um, some leaders in Washington who would just say this, this is a simple supply problem. Is that all that's at stake? Um, is that all that is at work? Is it, um, is that the problem? And we'll start with uh, Carolee. Thank you, Das. I would say that until you know what you're dealing with, until you measure what you're dealing with, you could never manage it. And what you need to do is get real with how much water there really is. And we need to get real with how this water has been allocated, who's using it, who has a right to use it, and whether it's being sold for a profit, which I agree with Hannah Beth is very wrong. I believe that we have the tools in our legal system to, um, make sure that the water belongs to the people, the, that the public trust doctrine needs to be enforced. But first of all, we have to quantify how much water is there. Then we have to understand that agriculture, which uses 80% of the water now, a lot of the water that's being used by agriculture is used to flood irrigate fields as much as 40% of the water used by agriculture is used to flood irrigate fields, that is a waste of, of, of water. We can cut back the consumption, the demand by agriculture 
by changing that practice. We can um, cut back the demand by agriculture by having certain crops looked at differently than they are now. I, I believe that agriculture needs to not be subsidized by the federal government the way that it currently is, especially in the Central Valley. And I think that will change the consumption and the demand for water. Currently, in the Central Valley, so much of the Westlands Water District is owned by just a few families, and a lot of, the, of, of what they get is subsidized, highly subsidized. So I think we need to look at how much is really there and really deal with the reality and stop this paper water that Yvonne was talking about. Stop expectations that are in contracts, including our own state water project contract here in Santa Barbara. We signed up for 42,000 acre feet of water and over the years since we've actually had that water delivered since 1998 to the year 2016, we've only gotten 28% of that water. We're paying $60 million a year as a county for that water. In Montecito, where I live, that water in 2014, we got 5% because that's all the state could deliver. That water cost Montecito $30,000 an acre foot. That is outrageous. But we have to pay the fixed costs of the state water project, whether we get a drop of water or not. So we need to look at the various supply sources and really start looking at them much more honestly. And I, I do think that, that the demand piece of it needs to be looked at. I think as, as, as much as we can make our, our supply local, the more we can do that, the better. I disagree with DOS about desal just slightly. I think desal is a tool in the toolbox. I agree that, that the current form of energy that's being used to supply desal is the wrong energy. I would advocate for photovoltaic solar energy. I have an, uh, a, an engineer, an analyst who I work with closely who has done a study who believes that we could use the Ortega, the top of the Ortega reservoir in Montecito and supply all of the photovoltaic energy we need to, for the desal plant. We need to, as Hannah Best said, we need to start being creative and thinking out of the box. There are ecological environmental ways to do desal. It's a local supply. We have to think of the environment with every step of the way, but we also have to think of the rate payers and how much our water costs. Now the state water project is economically not been good for Santa Barbara. And when we need the water, it's drought usually, and it's not there. When the water is available, we don't have a place to put it often because it's the first over the dam when Lake Kachuma spills. So I, I personally don't want to spend $30,000 an acre foot to just have it go over the dam. Montecito, in the drought, bought a lot of water from other areas, from rice farmers, from, from Stuart Resnick and the Kern Water Bank, which is, that's another long story, but it was stored in the San Luis Reservoir, which spilled. And when it spilled, all the millions of dollars Montecito had paid and all those millions of acre feet, or all those acre feet of water that Montecito had purchased, gone. So, you know, we are just not managing this very well currently, and um, it's, it's got to be rethought, but we first have to get honest about how much is there and who really has a right to use it. There's one more thing I'd like to say. Recently, the California, or no, the, the Supreme Court came down with the ruling that gave the Native Americans, and I think it was the California Supreme Court, um, gave Native Americans the first right to water because they have um, rights that were given by the federal government. And this case is very, very important. And CWIN and two other groups that 
partner with us in our litigation against the state to stop the tunnels, were approached by the California Indian Water Commission. They asked to be a co-plaintiff with us because they want to be a part of the solution and make sure that their rights are honored as well. We're honored to have them as a co-plaintiff with us. This, um, it, uh, the California Indian Water Commission has the jurisdiction of all Native American, of, of all California Native American water rights. So I'm very excited about that. We've also just had the Stanford Legal Center join us with this intense litigation that we will be facing to stop the tunnels and to really fix Cal the California water problem with the public trust doctrine and the California Constitution. Thank you, Carolee. Uh, Kenny, uh, tell, tell us what, what is the problem? Well, I think from, uh, from our perspective, um, you know, we wouldn't mind a little bit spilling over the dam and coming our way, but uh, 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 since uh, uh, for us, uh, water as a resource has always been a challenge. Um, you know, we didn't have running wa potable water until 1969. Um, I mean, that's unheard of for a community not to have access to clean water. Yet, all of those around us had clean water um, and it was plentiful. So for us, um, really being responsible um, and uh, obviously the, the rights and the fights uh, over water are an issue. You mentioned a, um, you know, a court case that you're following. I know that uh, Winters water rights uh, since I think it was 1908. This was based on Winters, but it goes beyond Winters, the it, Winters decision. Yeah, and, and while well, Winters and uh, with uh, surface water and, and now groundwater, groundwater. Well, this is, is the, one that does the step water. up, yes. Yeah. Um, so our, our very important uh, areas uh, that the tribe has been uh, watching closely in partnership with uh, many other tribes uh, around the nation. But um, really, it comes down to um, a, a kind of similar to my presentation on how we use it. Um, you know, whether it's, it's a time of drought or whether it's a time of, of uh, waters everywhere and, and it's accessible to everyone, um, you know, it's, it's a resource that uh, we're blessed to have and we need to be innovative on how we use it. Um, you know, we sent someone to the moon in the 70s. Uh, we've got cars that are driving themselves. Um, you know, we've got uh, some pretty amazing, talented uh, people in, in our world. And uh, I think innovation is something that, uh, you know, really we can do a lot more with. I heard a little bit about the desal plant um, and how it's f fueled. And if we can make that, um, you know, uh, responsibly mm -hmm. uh, exactly. uh, fueled or, or energized, uh, whether it's wind or solar or, or from wave power, you know, those are the kind of initiatives that we need to be looking at. And, uh, and perhaps maybe we don't build desal plants on land. We build them on barges so we can send them off to areas that need them throughout the state. I don't know what the, issue, what the uh, solution is, but I know that we just have to be innovative, regardless if we're in a drought or not. Thank you, Chairman. Senator Jackson. Well, let's face it. Part of this has to deal with, I mean, water has always been a problem, but climate change. Uh, it, the notion that we have an administration in Washington that refuses to acknowledge the science um, for a variety of reasons. Money is one of them. Idiocy is another. Um, uh, but, but it's real. And, you know, the, the, the increase in severe weather events throughout the world um, this past year, just in this country alone, I think of Houston. I think of the hurricanes that... Uh, uh, that hit Florida and that the intensity with which these storms are occurring. We had that water burst or whatever they called it here in Santa Barbara this summer. It's bizarre weather. Uh, we're seeing bizarre weather everywhere. They're having uh, a terrible, we used to call them nor'easters back uh, in, in Boston, but I mean, whether it's going into ch uh, bone chilling uh, temperatures. Um, We've got to address the fact that uh, man-made behavior is impacting our climate. And to the extent that it is as a result of our behavior, we have to change our behavior. Um, it may not all be because of our behavior. Mother Ma Nature does not share her playbook with us. But uh, clearly, we are in me great measure responsible uh, for at least some of its impacts. So. We need to address that and be honest about it. 
And the reason that we're not, besides, as I mentioned, having a lunatic in the White House, and I'd say that to the lunatic's face, I make no bones about my feelings about him, um, there's money that's driving this debate. The oil industry's out there, they, want, you know, they have for decades run this country. I don't know if they ran it before LBJ was president, but he was an oil guy. You know, George W. was an oil guy. Dick Cheney was an oil guy. And as has been pointed out to me, we go to war for the oil industry. That's how powerful they are. And I can tell you, they put more money into Sacramento fighting against bills that I've tried to bring, and Monique in her first year uh, have tried to bring to, to protect our environment and to find alternatives and to, and to develop and encourage those new technologies that are already out there, uh, their resistance to them. Uh, and their power in undermining our efforts. So I think we have, to, we have to elect people who are going to think about the environment and the future first and our children and the fact that we have borrowed this planet from them. We don't have any right to make decisions that are going to have this kind of effect. So, I mean, I think that's the philosophical underpinning. And the other is, again, putting on my political hat, and politics is the art of the possible, there are a number of different, I guess we call them multimodalities. You know, we got a lot of options here. They're not all perfect. I mean, let's think about certainly conservation's the best of the lot. There's a lot we can do there. But there's a whole issue of reuse, recycle, uh, creating potable water. We talk about desal, recharging our aquifers. Um, th there are um, a, a bunch of options, and we need to uh, prioritize them because we need water. And people who don't have access to water because of its expense, everybody, it is a human right to have drinking water, safe drinking water, uh, and in sufficient amounts so that people can continue to live. So um, that's just sort of the, the, the fundamental issues, and we can get down into the weeds a little more if you like. Great. So, I, you know, I'm going to give an economist answer at first, um, which is I, I believe the basic problem is that we have no rational way to allocate the commons. Yes, and that's... The commons that's is the commons, and every, every system that people come up for how to split it up doesn't work very well. Um, and, um, you know, back when communities were smaller, you were, there were simple solutions for this, right? Somebody trashed the commons, um, they got beat up, executed or exiled based, depending on what civilization it was from, right? Based on the judicial system of that civilization, um, there were remedies to um, violate, violating or abusing the commons. There is not remedies, effective remedies to violating or abusing the commons in our society. Um, you know, the, the way that um, in the West we have allocated water is by um, how early of a user were you? First user has the greatest right. Second user has the second most right. Third user has the third most right. And I got to say, even though we deal with that framework still, that is insane. I mean, so all the first users, they're dead. It's just their farms that are still there. Or their businesses in our crazy civilization still have life that seems undying. And because someone's ancestor was one of the first people to come pillage California, and in, you know, I, I'm talking pillage, right? The, all the people who rolled in here first were pillaging, right? Sutter, celebrated by our, all our textbooks, a slaver, you know, you know a, a rapist of sex slaver of native peoples, you know? It, it, the, so just because your ancestor was one of the first people to come pillage, it, that doesn't, that's not a rational reason you should have a greater water right. No, let's, let's, let's be clear about that. Um, there are progressive people on the other side of our political divide. I think most of the people here are probably, you know, on, the, on, on, our, on our left side of the political divide. There are people who do seek to allocate this rational in a price-driven manner. That's probably better than what we have right now. Um, but there's problems with that. There's obvious flaws with that, which is 
that there are people with little or no money to have water, and that's where the human right for water and that where that movement has gained steam, thankfully. Um, and and se secondly, uh, there are basic watershed functions that if you don't allocate an amount for, um, or ecological functions like fisheries, then you're going to destroy something else and create even greater problems. And, and that's you know, difficult, though not impossible, to adjudicate, um, which is you know, one of the great trends. Um, and again, I'll actually say that that's progress over the old way of doing things. It is not a perfect way to allocate the commons. Um, I'm going to give you a couple real illustrations of that um, that should be personal and close to home right now. I spent the last couple days um, uh, carrying water to people's um, cars in Montecito and Summerland at the water stations. So because of the problems that uh, Senator Jackson uh, uh, gave us some uh, information on, there is a limited amount of non-potable water in Montecito Water District, which extends from um, essentially the edge of, of the city at Coast Village over to uh, and including Summerland. And um, how much people use really matters when you don't have enough pumps to keep on getting groundwater, which is your cleanest source in our area. Um, when you're dependent upon your secondary sources, you don't, you're not getting Kachuma water, and that's all really infected with a lot of ash and sediment, it matters how much people use. And there's people out there who are not taking showers, who are acting very responsibly, who are, um, you know, and I always said, it's probably enough for you to take a shower every once in a while. But yeah, which, that's not good news. right next door, there's someone hosing off the driveway, right? You know, um, trying to act normal, uh, which is a normal human response in a disaster to try to create some normalcy. There's not enough water for that. And if enough people do that, they'll run out of water. And we'll have to go from a situation where most of these supposed to be folks are supposed to be evacuated, but we're not like sending in people to drag people out of their homes to where they'll have to leave because there won't be any, any water for them. That should be a wake-up call and a vivid illustration. That's a microcosm of our whole problem, right? Is that some people will act responsibly, especially if you send them the right price signals or the right legal signals. And some people, as long as they have the uh, ability to abuse the commons, they will. Uh, one last one, Summerland. You know that little liquor store that is right now their only source, well, it, it, that now the free, they can leave Summerland. But for a while was their only, believe me, I, 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 I had to take a boat to get here yesterday. It, it's been an interesting week. Um, uh, I live in Carpinteria. Uh, that little liquor store had a, had a little water um, uh, machine out in front, right? One guy came by and emptied the whole thing, right? Oh. right? And that's even priced. Uh, now, it's, it's, oh. its market value probably has gone up since the disaster, and the machine's keeping on charging the same amount, so, so there was no rational allocation. But, you know, it's just um, a lot of people a lot of people do cast this, uh, you know, and I think there's some reason to say, you know, uh, it, it's, a, it's a, a fish versus farms debate or a people versus farms deb debate. There, there's some rationality to that argument. I do maintain, though, that's not a very useful thing for our problem on the South Coast. Our problem on the South Coast, with the exception of the state water that Carol Lee is, of course, talking about, and I think has a point about, is, is a question of lawns versus people. We allocate, our system allocates equal value between human beings and lawns. Our current allocation system treats them exactly the same. 
and they, they shouldn't be. You know, uh, many of the years that were deficit years, drought years, our deficit was less than the amount that we use on turf. So many of those drought years would not have been a drought year if we just didn't have lawns. Um, and would that not have made us more resilient? And do they really matter that much? So I have a couple other questions. Um, uh, Senator Jackson teed off one, but I'll, I'll hold that um, uh, I'll hold that powder dry for a second. Um, how sustainable are groundwater practices in the state of California? Um, obviously, we the community has more consciousness about Kachuma, but for most communities, groundwater is still the primary source and. I would argue for many of our communities, groundwater is still the primary source of water. Um, and again, I'll just keep the same order. Carol, you can kick it off. Well, groundwater is a very interesting subject statewide as well as locally. California was the 49th state to get any regulations over groundwater. They're, they're very weak, but we are beginning to grapple with the groundwater issues here in California. In the Central Valley, after the invention of the electric pump, uh, the, there was, has been a race to the bottom of the aquifers in, in the lower Central Valley. And until, again, until all pumping is measured, we cannot manage the groundwater basins. Groundwater basins are harder to understand because you can't see underground. Hydrologists understand them a lot better but I believe that without very logical regulation of groundwater, such as measure it, we have to know how to measure it, we're not going to have sustainable groundwater practices. In the Central Valley, again, um, they have experienced places of land subsidence, which means that the aquifer collapses on itself because too much water was pumped out as much as 95 feet. Now, if this continues, what it does is impacts the, the pipes, the canals, the everything else. And yet, the farmers have been very reticent to allow their groundwater consumption to be measured. I believe that needs to change if they want to have a viable groundwater basin themselves. And another very dangerous thing that has begun to happen is that empty groundwater basins are being used as what is called water banks. The Kern County Water Bank is a very good example of this, and I know quite a bit about that water bank because we were the ones who sued to get it turned back to the public. Originally, the Kern Water Groundwater Bank was belonged to the Department of Water Resources and was a resource to store surplus water in times in years of plenty for the urban users of the state water project. That was given away in 1995 in the Monterey Amendments to the Kern Water Bank, which the next day turned it over to the Kern Water Bank Authority, which is 58% control, controlled by a man named Stuart Resnick, who has profited mightily from that water bank, and in fact, in this last drought, sold water from that water bank back to Montecito at exorbitant prices. We need resources like this to remain public. My big soapbox, if you will, is I believe water is a public resource that it needs to be looked at, at through the public trust doctrine, which is law that goes back to 500 AD and the time of Justinian, has come down to us, the public trust doctrine has come down to us through the Magna Carta in, in 1215, which was signed by King John. His nobles forced him to do this because they got tired of paying the king to fish in the rivers or to use the rivers to navigate in the rivers. They got tired of paying the king. The public trust doctrine has been incorporated in the American, the US Constitution, and as each state 
came into the union, they also incorporated the public trust doctrine. This tool has not been used enough by the public. And of course, the big corporate interests and the people who are trying to privatize water don't want the public trust doctrine used because it would limit their ability to turn water into a commodity and profit from it. So I believe the real solution for California and other public trust resources is to utilize the public trust doctrine fully as much as we possibly can. And we, the people, need to take back our water. Chairman Kahn. So, and I know, I know that the uh, monitoring of wells is certainly a hot topic. Um, and, uh, you know, looking at the, the, the difference from uh, residential use and, and agricultural use is staggering. Um, you know, from the tribe's perspective, you know, we're, we're constantly trying to protect our rights. So from w one aspect, we understand um, you know, when folks are putting their, their, digging their heels in the sand to protect their rights, but when they're, um, you know, not being responsible or when no one's watching, um, they're really squandering, it does really make you think of, of how can we collaboratively, um, you know, look at, at, at how we can measure um, and hold accountable uh, what our water usage is, whether it's through monitoring, uh, or other programs, but I, I think it's important that, that those that are being responsible, that are looking at innovative ways uh, to use less of their groundwater, um, should also be recognized uh, in that process. So not just a strict uh, monitoring, but maybe looking at ways that if they do put in significant investments in, uh, Senator Jackson pointed out earlier, some of the farmers are just flooding, you know, for watering. Well, we, we've got some uh, great ways that we can use with drip systems and, and, and uh, d different ways where you can use water to specifically deliver uh, the, the nutrients in the water to these different types of, of plants. And so I think those things should be rewarded um, and thought of, so. Thank you, and I'll, I'll just uh, say that I, I number one, um, I do not think historically groundwater practices have been sustainable in California, and it remains to see um, how effective um, and complete uh, a landmark piece of legislation that I think at least two people in this room helped out with, um, uh, SIGMA, the, um, our groundwater sustainability uh, law in the state. Um, it remains to be seen how effective that will be because it, it now the brilliance of it is it essentially said, look, um, because there are no agencies that control um, groundwater, unless you don't, unless you set up agencies, the state's going to take control. And of course, nobody in any community wants the state to take control. So everybody put aside their differences. I mean, for decades, nobody had the political will to form groundwater um, agencies, and all of a sudden, when you say that the state will take control if you don't. They put aside their differences, at least for the time being, enough to form uh, a groundwater agency. Um, it, I think it will remain to be seen how many of these agencies really want to comply with both the spirit and letter of the law by um, making sure that there is um, sustainability over a 20-year time horizon and how many just want to run out the clock for as long as possible um, remains to be a scene. I am a, 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 a board member of one in the Kuyama Valley, um, and it's, it's, very, it's very different than, than I mean, I, I fundamentally agree with the philo philosophical viewpoint of Senator Jackson and Carol, that Carolee and the S Senator Jackson are articulating that this is a public resource. Um, but in the Kuyama Valley, you know, uh, the only agency we could put together um, meant that property owners had a large vote of the agency, um, uh, a, a um, you know, majority vote of the agency. And it, it, is, um, it is definitely not how they view it. Right? Um, and, uh, you know, I, I do have a little bit of hope. I, I hope that the, some of these uh, agricultural companies are going to say, look, we got to the, be the here for the long haul. We got we to change some things. 
And sometimes I hear that noise and sometimes I hear noises that make me feel like it's gonna be the run out of the clock strategy. Um, so I, I think uh, making Sigma work agency by agency is crucial. And because these agencies are so small, there's the, the, the public activism that takes place is crucial. You know, in the Kuyama Valley, historically, you know, an average citizen does not have a lot of political power. But average people showing up at the Kuyama GSA meetings at this point has tremendous importance because at the end of the day, the state will have to evaluate, is this a real plan? Is this a plan towards sustainability? Because one of the mandates of the law is that um, each agency has to produce a plan for sustainability. And of course, all of it also depends on how much we empower the state and support the state to be tough on the plans, right? To really analyze those plans and say, you know what? This is too rosy of a picture of how much water is there. Um, and uh, so I think uh, on groundwater, and the question Senator Jackson is, uh, are, you know, how sustainable are groundwater practices today and, um, you know, uh, and what, what can be done about it? What are, um, uh, the, what's the future of groundwater? Um, and, and I also want to make the caveat that there are, are definitely people in this audience that know m more about this than, than I do. Um, but I'll turn it over to Senator Jackson. Yeah. Great. So I think what we have to recognize is that not everybody shares our perspective on Mother Nature. So people think that it's there to use, and they want to use it because they need it. And if you look at the disparity in viewpoints in this state, it's really quite stark. Um, in the Central Valley of California, that water is there for them to use. And they want to grow their crops, and sure, they want to have good drinking water, but so be it. Um, they look at us on the coast as a bunch of, what is the new term, snowflakes? I'm still not sure what the heck that's supposed to mean. But, uh, I mean, if you look at a snowflake, they're quite beautiful, actually. Uh, but I'm sure that's so not... So are you, Senator. Thank you, thank you. They're, they're not... I, I'm sure that's not the intention of the phrase. But So we have to recognize people look at resources differently for these farmers and particularly in areas where there is an enormous uh, level of unemployment. These people just want to be able to do what they need to do to make a living. It's all about really basic night life necessities. It's not about anything else. It's being able to feed their families and they see the two as contradictory. Somehow or other, they, we have to make people understand that they are uh, um, cohesive, that they are codependent, um, and, and I think that is a challenge. And up until recently, California had no groundwater plan. It's extraordinary to me. I come from a, a state where, you know, it rains so darn much, but there was also a plan. Here, it's first come, first serve, and as, as uh, Carolee kept um, mentioning, you can't manage if you can't measure. Well, you can't monitor if you can't measure, and you can't, you can't manage if you can't monitor. And those, that's the three M's that we've tried. I've tried to do legislation on this just so that we can go in and measure. What a battle just to be able to measure. Our people, we let people self-report how much water they're using. Well, with all due respect, 95% of the people totally aren't agree. going to tell you how much they're using. And so I did some legislation on this, and... We got it passed, um, but I, I was astonished at what a battle it was. So we have to realize that in California, the history is that if you've um, got senior water rights, you can take your straw and you can dig as darn well deep as you want, and the heck with the guy downstream from you. So it's a culture shift that we have to do, and um, it's not easy. When we did our legislation, I think you were still in the assembly when uh, we did this big water bond. We had to put $2 billion in for cement, you know, for dams. You know, nobody in their right mind wants to dam anything up. It doesn't 
do the job, and, and, and the good news was well, you couldn't dam anything for $2 billion, but we were able to kind of shove that through and start doing, uh, putting money in uh, for some of the more intelligent approaches to this using, as you say, technology. We can send a man to the moon. We can do just about, you know, we can end up with robots who are going to be able to do the things that that people do, why in the world can't we uh, take uh, for one of life's necessities and figure out how to make it technologically um, effective? Well, part of the reason is you have to make it financially desirable. Because money still, you know, whether you like it or not, people are driven by the opportunity to make money at something. And that isn't necessarily bad. It's just that we don't want to take <coughs> away the notion that there are certain things that you just need to control. Some of life's necessities cannot be driven by profit or exclusively by profit. And we have to have a balance, and that's part of the discussion. And that we'll still be having this conversation for quite some time. Thank you, Senator. Now, we want to take some audience questions. I have a few more questions I have not asked, but I want to be able to make sure that we have uh, mix it up a little bit and answer some audience questions. I have this gentleman here on the left. I want to thank all four of you for the work you're doing in the world and for being here. Uh, I've heard a lot of information about philosophy, about technology, a little bit about morality. Senator Jackson maybe just brought up a little bit of a different perspective, but I want to ask the chairman a question about bringing in the idea of spirituality or maybe worldview would be a better word. Um, the unique success that you've had with the tribe, and it's very special. I, I, I did four tours of duty at Standing Rock, and every morning we went down to the river and we, we did it, the women led us in a two-hour blessing. We didn't think of the water, Miniwichoni, the essence of what you and I are. We didn't think of it as a resource. We thought of it as a relative. As, as, and, 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 and that's a worldview kind of an idea. And I'm just wanted to ask a, an unusual question in the scholarly audience, perhaps. If the traditional understandings of the Chumash had a role in your success? Uh, absolutely. That's the driver. Um, you know, culturally uh, and traditionally, water is uh, a resource that is uh, provided to us by our uh, Mother Earth. And so, you know, traditionally, whenever we take uh, from our great Mother Earth, we give back. Uh, we provide an offering, whether it's tobacco, whether it's prayer, uh, or whether it's just uh, being responsible with that resource. And so, first and foremost, um, you know, culturally, uh, whether it's water or any other resource uh, or the land, uh, that's what is driving uh, the driving factor when it comes to how we, we, we uh, treat that. The other significance uh, in, in the ability for us to be able to control um, how water is used is, you know, we're, we're very small. Uh, we're a tribal government, a uh, sovereign nation. So we're able to put uh, restrictions in place. Um, and it's a whole lot easier. We, we're not as, well, actually, we are as bureaucratic when it comes to family. Um, and, uh, but, uh, you know, we're able to put those initiatives in place. So we can, we can, we can uh, say it's a drought all year long, every day, for the rest of our life, um, and, and treat it uh, from that perspective as well. And I, Thank you. I'll just say that I do think that um, uh, spirituality has a role in this. I, I think that the, the, the biggest malaise of our society is fundamentally selfishness, and we, we have allowed that to infect every part of our lives, including reinventing faiths. Right? I mean, you know, we've reinvented faiths um, around our materialist values where even um, they get misused. Um, but in my view, um, uh, I, you know, I w once went on a, a radio talk show, uh, uh, a right wing talk show about the plastic bag ban. And, uh, you know, I, I gave what kind of ra some rational policy driven arguments. and. And they and and they 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 went. Um, so it just seems at the end of the day that 
Um, this is about social engineering, right? And, um, you know, it's, and I said, uh, yeah, I'm a Christian. We believe in building a better world. <laughs> um, and uh, uh, he didn't have a good answer for that one. But, um, uh, you know, I, I think we all need to connect with, with um, our uh, faith and our faith traditions. And that, that, um, that values is part of the solution here. Um, well, the other can, can I, yeah, um, I wish that were true, but as you, as you observe, uh, what people have done in the name of religion, all the hate we hear today, all the, uh, objections to, uh, addressing the climate issues on a faith, some twisted view of faith, um, I think that's a long time in coming, uh, as much as I would like to think otherwise. Um, I think, though, if we recognize certain basic human instincts, we can work with those. There is a, uh, a basic human instinct f of, for security, for safety, um, for, for protection of one's family, um, for the ability to survive. And I think that um, if we talk about these issues in that context, while trying to redefine religion on its, and I think initially intended terms, although I don't want to get into a big argument about religion or discussion about it. This is real, really about how do we get people to see that it's in their own best interests. I mean, that, that's, especially in today's world. You know, they may go low and we go high, but they are going so low that it's just really hard to have a discussion on that moral basis. Um, as much as the people in this room, I suspect, share that. What we need to do is appeal to people's basic instinct for survival. And for a lot of people, if you talk about water, the need to be able to drink water, what does that entail? You get to people's selfishness. I, I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. That's human nature. But it's by emerging from that self-protection that people recognize that it does indeed take a village. So I don't have any problem with talking about um, the fact that making sure that the guy upstream isn't putting uh, dangerous pesticides in your drinking water. Um, you talk about how can, we, how can we let you grow your crops without poisoning the people who are drinking that water. And that's what we work on. Uh, so that's, uh, I don't know, maybe it's taken all these years of listening to my colleagues who come from the Central Valley, who come from, it's, it's like, you know, California, Mississippi. Um, and actually, even in this, uh, this own district, I mean, I represent Santa Maria, and I represent Santa Barbara. And you know how much there's love between those two areas. There are two very different ways of seeing the world, but there is a certain commonality, and that's where we have to find that commonality. And I think if we do that, we'll have more success. I would just like to add one thing to what everyone else has said, and I think that the, the people, the public, need to understand that there are tools, that there are legal tools, that there are legal things that they can use to help assure that we do have water for everyone. The public trust doctrine, which I've been speaking of all afternoon, is one of those tools, and it's been very underutilized. It's only been utilized to, to save Mono Lake in, a, in, a, in the water context. I mean, that was the biggest thing that's happened. That was one lake. Sea Wind would like to use it to save the 20 rivers of the Delta watershed. We would like to get a public trust analysis so that the environment gets a seat at the table. I think it's time to rethink how these resources are approached by the public as well as by our legislators. And I think that's going to be a fight, but we do have the law on our side. I've been a believer ever since I have become a water activist back in the, in the mid 80s. Sue the bastards. That's about the only thing that really gets results. As a lawyer, that's music to our ears, you know, <laughs> just saying. But it, it works if you're a, you know, the, the David and the David and Goliath scenario, you can win. We, the people, can win, and we must.
other, uh, let's take another audience question and then I have a, a question if it's not asked by the audience that needs to be asked. Ruth? So we are all going to have to do 60 second answers because there's, there is one more question that we need to ask and it's 10 minutes to six. So, so the short answer to me is we need to take steps. Look, there are hundreds of well users drawing out of the same water table as the public water supply. True. If you had hundreds of water users that had pipes into Kachuma, and the public learned about that, there would be riots in this town. But that's the reality in Montecito. Um, that is a very difficult fundamental framework to deal with. And it is the reason why the primary criteria I had for the Montecito planning commissioners that I named was, are you willing to, when it's discretionary, to deny wells? Deny wells. Um, uh, you know, I, it is in areas that are served by the water district to have someone pumping out from the same water that the water district relies upon. Um, it that's that is self-defeating, at very least. So my answer is that you have two choices when you have all these water districts. You have a carrot and you have a stick. And you use them both. <laughs> and that's what we've been doing with the water districts that serve Santa Barbara County. So it's either you do it, you come together and you figure something out or we're gonna impose something on you because we can. <coughs> it's amazing how when people are put to that test, they don't want the government imposing something on them. So that's what we're having, frankly, happen here. We've had these incredible meetings with the different water districts. The first meeting, I remember one of them, which shall remain name nameless, but it's up in the San Inez area. They came in, belt buckles and all, arms crossed, legs crossed. But by the time we were done, they were sitting there in earnest, and right now they've been very actively involved and engaged in finding a solution. There are just there are ways to do it, and sometimes, frankly, it's necessity. And uh, that brings people together. And you know, we haven't, we're not quite there yet, uh, but it's been an amazing uh, metamorphosis and I've enjoyed every minute of it. Uh, but I think that's what it is. We have carrots, we have sticks. Uh, I want to use the prerogative of the organizer to ask my own question. Sure. Um, I mean, I probably shouldn't ask this because we're about to end on a hopeful note. But I'll ask it anyhow. Uh, if you sort of step back and take a look at California, we have a situation where water plants, California historically has had, it's biblical. We've had seven good years and seven lean years. There's no such thing as average water delivery. State water planning was done during the good years. That's right. Um, we basically move water from Northern California and the mountains mm -hmm. to Southern California, which is a semi-desert. Um, we have an unsustainable situation with a growing population. Um, so if you look out 10, and now of course it's all exacerbated by climate change, which will increase the seven lean years. So if you look out into the future, five, 10, 15 years out, what is the solution? And I'll just put a political question in there. Um, we have a state government which is controlled completely by the Democratic Party pretty much. Um, which in general is thought of as more progressive on these issues. What is to stop us, what is stopping us from stepping back, taking the big picture look, and coming up with the solution? Um, as um, Chairman Khan said, you know, you're a small community so you can make decisions and impose them. You're a sovereign nation. Well, California is in a way a sovereign nation also. What's stopping us from solving this problem? Well, I, I have to tell you, not all Democrats are created equally. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was throwing you a softball. So. 
Um, I, I wish I could answer that. I would say created equally. It's what they've done with it. But. That's true. That's true. <laughs> um, we have, uh, again, environmentalists are viewed as sort of uh, elitists, and that's been efforts that have been made by um, uh, Republican, the Republican Party and Republicans for decades. It's part of their effort to uh, marginalize and to uh, um, to undermine our efforts on the environment. Um, and they've been very successful with Republicans, who so will never get Republican support. We used to have Republican, I mean, even Richard Nixon started the EPA. But, but that is now anathema to that whole philosophy. We're just a bunch of overindulged, rich people, elitists, who don't care about working people. So some of our colleagues who represent working people really don't care about A, B, C, and D that we've been talking about. Their people just want to put food on the table of their families. And they have been persuaded that they are mutually exclusive when they are not. And so one of the things that we have to do is re-educate and re-inform people that they go hand in hand. And that is one of the key things I think we need to do, is explain to people going forward why they work together. And it's taken the other side as 40 or 50 years. You know, it used to be that William Rehnquist was like a right-wing whack job on the US Supreme Court. By the time he was done, he was considered a relative moderate conservative. So when you think about how far that uh, you know, we move to the right. Um, and it, it, it's been the effective messaging of the, the Republicans, the Libertarians, what have you, uh, that really is souring or has soured uh, people so that we end up with what we've got in the White House today. Um, we have got to do a better job re-educating people, and that's where uh, both the bad news and the good news. There is hope. I think he is self-destructing in many ways, but the problem is he's bringing a lot of the country with him, which is why I've introduced my oil bill, um, and I think this year we can get that passed. I think he's pushed the envelope too far. Now is our moment, but we've got a lot of work to do. We just cannot assume that everybody thinks the way we do. The rack. I'll, I'll, I'll uh, say that I, I, I put out there the, the idea that um, the, one of the basic problems um, is that we rush to the biggest, most expensive, longest to permit um, uh, construction projects for a, any, any crisis. Um, part of that is human nature. We like to look at big things and go, that's going to save us, right? A dam or desal plant. Um, uh, when, it, in my view, the solutions are in, in us and our behavior. Um, but um, I think the other reason why we gravitate towards the big projects is there's a lot of money in it. And there are, is a lot of power behind it. Um, and, um, and that do makes us do irrational things. Um, and we as environmentalists are really bad at marshalling people who have similar interests but don't see the view, don't see the world the same we way we do. I mean, I I'll tell you uh, uh, something that a lot of people don't realize. It's not good ideas that turn government. It is power, it is people using power and you all have power, whether you use it or not. Um, it, and the reason why good environmental legislation has pe been passed in recent years is actually not because of the political power of environmentalists. It's because of the political power of the building and construction trades union that has seen common interest and has seen the long term and gone, you know what, we're gonna get on board on alternative energy. If that hadn't happened, we would have gotten less than half of what we've gotten done. Yep. And we, we as environmentalists need to work with other folks to create coalitions like we have been created on energy, on, on water. Um, and one of the basic things should be, you know, um, 
we don't need to do more expensive solutions until we first have used every drop twice, right? We don't. It, it's the same technology as desal, but it's a lot less energy to push it through the membranes. Water recycling, which I appreciate the tribe for doing, I appreciate the city of Santa Barbara for doing. We need to be recycling and using every drop twice, and fundamentally the only reason why we don't is because we're afraid of poop water. And I got news for you. You all drink poop water. <laughs> Every molecule of water has been pooped on several hundred thousand times in the, the, in the millions of years that it has been around. And it doesn't matter how clean it was, it matters how clean it is when you drink it. And so if we have the technology to make it clean enough to be used for some things, and if you're just too scared, it doesn't have to be for drinking water, um, then let's do it. And let's not abuse the planet and, anymore until we've done that twice. Well, I, I would like to answer that question by going back to the themes that I've been talking about all afternoon, and that is we have to measure how much we actually have. We have to quantify what's there. We have to consider the, the public trust analysis and, and the public trust doctrine to consider, give the environment a seat at the table, an economic value for the public trust resources so it does have an, a, a, a seat at the table. And the people have to realize it's our water. It should never be commodified. It's for all of us. And I think that's a very powerful tool. So I want to thank our panel. Uh, <laughs> and really a special thanks because this has been a terrible time, I know, for all of you. And to give us your time. There is a water forum coming up. Someone wants to make an announcement? Just very quickly. First forum was on the water dynamics and uh, of the of the region, and this week's or next week's program was going to be on water quality issues, but instead it's going to be an overview of a panel of experts on uh, information about the uh, recent emergency in the region. Thank you. Uh, there may or may not be wine and cheese party outside. I'm not sure, but if there is, you're welcome. Right. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Reggie. Thank you, Kenny. Yeah.